Legend Total War here, and today we're doing another tier list using Tier Maker. This time doing the most requested of the tier lists, the hero tier list. So every single generic uh, hero in Total War Warhammer 2 that you can recruit with every single race is available here to, uh, to rank. Uh, so we're just excluding the legendary heroes or heroes that are sort of unique. Like for example the ancestor heroes with the dwarfs. Because basically any of the legendary heroes will always hit like an S tier. So there's basically, there's no real reason to come. They're always awesome. Okay, so as always, this is based around legendary difficulty campaign, very hard battle, no mods, no multiplayer around ultra unit scale. However, in this one here, I imagine that no matter which setting that you're playing on, uh, this is going to be pretty much valid. Um, I feel like when it comes to single entities and heroes, anything that's good on legendary difficulty is good on easy difficulty and medium difficulty and hard difficulty and small unit scale. So all of that stuff should still be valid because a lot of the things that take into consideration with these heroes is um, their agent actions, how good their agent actions are, and um, how good their traits are, and also how good their actual abilities are on the battlefield. Some heroes should not be attached into your armies, others should definitely be attached into your armies, but we'll, we'll go through all the various things. Now another thing is that uh, many of these heroes are, are locked behind DLC. And so the channel's always been, well, for a long time now, has been sponsored by Instant Gaming. So whenever there is a hero that is um, locked behind a certain DLC, I will mention which DLC it is. Some of them are FLC as well. I'll try to mention that as well. Um, but yeah, if you like what's, uh, what I'm saying about a particular hero and you don't have that DLC, don't forget to check out Instant Gaming. There currently isn't a... Um, a Steam sale going on, so you might be able to find that particular DLC at a great price. Uh, instant gaming keys are significantly discounted. Okay, so let's jump into how we're going to organize this. We're going to organize it based on the uh, the timeline of when they were introduced into Total War Warhammer. So Empire is first, Warhammer 1 race is first, and then we end with the Vampire Coast, which was the, the last race to actually be added so far. Okay, so, so if in the timeline you'll see um, Empire, Dwarf, Greenskins, yada yada yada, that kind of stuff. So there'll be 15 um, um, placements for you to, to look over. Alright, let's get on to this. Now, I guess one other thing to, to cover is that this tier list here, you shouldn't consider D to be like, Oh, this hero sucks. No heroes in this game suck. There's none that should be like, you never recruit. Basically, it comes down to this. S tier are like the amazing heroes, and D tier are like the good heroes. Like, definitely get, like, every single hero in the game is viable. And I try to get as many of them as I can, but it comes down to priorities. I'll always prioritize an S tier hero over a D tier hero, and then I'll get the D tier heroes later. That's all. I just want to make a distinction about that. So this is really about not which are good and which are bad, but how good all of these heroes actually are. Okay. So, hang on, let me just turn this down a little bit. Okay, and uh, let's start with the Humble Empire Captain. Now, funny thing is about this one is that I actually don't think it's a particularly great hero. I'm going to put it at C tier. Um, in terms of traits, uh, the best trait is either sort of Discipline, Regal, or Noble. Um, discipline, giving boost to the army, Regal, providing public order in the in the region and noble providing extra income in the in the province so i usually don't put these guys in my armies because i find that warrior priests are better at holding the line better at dishing out damage and they've got better buffs just better battle battle abilities in total these guys here are okay at doing agent actions i primarily use them to either assault enemy garrisons or assault armies they're pretty decent at that uh the empire is rich enough to be able to afford to do lots of agent actions but I don't think it's a high priority. I also us usually use these guys in areas that have a lot of public order problems because this is, is a public order hero to just boost the public order in a province. But in terms of priorities, he's definitely a C tier. Next up, we got the uh, the Witch Hunter. I'm going to put this one here at B tier. I also don't put this one in my armies because I find that they have no ability to hold the line. They've got some cool abilities, but in the late game, they don't really scale particularly well compared to other things. And so I find that these guys here are much better roaming the lands uh, doing agent actions and getting rid of corruption. That's really their MO anyway. So the primary thing I get them to do is block enemy armies. Using uh, Arch Lectors, you can now boost the success chance of all of your Witch Hunters and um, 
and Warrior Priests faction-wide by 10% each. So you can end up giving them like 100% success chance even at tier 1. And also the uh, the Archvectors also increase the amount of uh, Untainted that, that all characters can do. So these guys just go around get rid of uh, Untainted and block enemy armies. Not a high priority, but they're very good at their job. So I put them at B tier. They would be probably at C tier if it wasn't for Archvectors. Alright, then we move on to the Warrior Priest. I'm also going to put this one here at... B... No, I'm going to put this at A tier. Because this guy here has got multi-purpose. I do like to attach these guys into my armies because they're really good at holding the line way better than... than um, Empire Great Swords. They increase your replenishment rate, which is definitely good. And in um, they also increase the growth in a province. So having these guys... Um, in your like having a lot of them in your army when you capture a province you can get the growth going really quickly or you can get a whole bunch of them and move them over to a specific region and just build up the growth really quickly uh it's a little bit expensive to do that but if you need the growth quickly you've got the option to do so so this this is a really versatile melee hero i usually leave them on foot i find they're better on foot than on horseback uh just because it's a smaller target and you want them to hold the line uh so you need them to last a lot longer so that's what i do with them i think they're an a tier hero pretty good then we've got the battle with now, in the case of wizards here, there are seven laws of magic that the Empire can draw from. Um, but I'm only going to just mention battle wizards, right? Because it all uses up the same unit capacity, and going through every single type of wizard, th like, there's more of <laughs> there's more of those kind of heroes than all the other heroes combined. But there will be distinctions in the case of, like, for example, Goblin and uh, Orc Shaman, because the game actually does make a distinction between those two. Alright, so in terms of Battle Wizards, this one here is actually going up into S tier, because these guys are really versatile. They've got access to the Knowledgeable trait, which is really useful for the Empire, so that'll give you five extra wins of magic um, for all of your armies. Really, really useful. They've also got access to Disciplined. Um, the laws of magic that I prioritize are Fire Magic, if you just want a pure damage dealer. Really good at that. I... Um, Life Wizard or Jade Wizard if you want to go with a hero spam because you can heal your heroes. Really useful for that. Um, the Amber Wizard is actually quite useful because they get a Griffin mount. They're the only one of the heroes that get a Griffin mount. So you can have a Griffin Doom stack essentially. Uh, Beast Magic is... It's, it's okay. It's not great. Um, but you could always just... Um, tag in uh, just one other wizard and just use the other, other Beast Wizard as uh, magic batteries. And... Um, I guess all of the winds of magic are pretty good. The only only law of magic that isn't present in battle wizards is the law of metal, which Gelt is supposed to represent. But um, they don't just have uh, like good battle abilities. These guys are also reasonably good at increasing the amount of income in a province because they've got a, a trait that a skill in their um, skill tree that increases the income in a province. And then there's also a trait that they can get called Noble, which will give them an extra 10% on top of that. So what you can do with a whole bunch of battle wizards, if you don't need them in your armies, is stick them in a particularly rich province and just boost your income. So these guys here have multi-purpose. They are really good, excellent uh, wizards. And uh, the Empire does have access to a lot of Winds of Magic because you get lots of knowledgeable. You've got also lots of followers as well. Uh, so there's a lot you can do with Battle Wizards. Okay, so that's the Empire there. Let's move on now to uh, the Dwarfs. Okay, so first one we're talking about is the uh, the uh, the Engineer. Uh, I'm going to put this guy at S tier because this is probably the most important hero for the Dwarfs. Because this guy, I don't use him so much on the campaign map, but he's pretty much essential for the dwarf armies, unless you're going to go with a melee spam, which you shouldn't. Uh, it's up to you, I guess. So this guy here increases campaign movement range, but only one of them will do it. So stacking like five of them in an army is not going to stack that ability. Uh, they increase the amount of uh, ammunition, which that stacks. They increase the amount of missile damage, that stacks. They increase the amount of um, the reload time reduction, that stacks. They've also got the Zuffbar 42 pounders, that stacks. And uh, they can make pretty good snipers. I definitely wouldn't give them the blunderbuss. That's crap. Um, they're okay in melee, but I wouldn't use them in that regard. And they can buff all missile units around them. So this guy here, just having one of them in your dwarf armies, can give all of your artillery just and, and missile units so much extra battle potential at uh, such a, a small cost, really. So a really good hero to attach into your armies. Uh, then we've got the runesmith. Um, I don't think runesmiths are fantastic. Uh, I'm going to put it at B tier. Uh, rune magic is a bit of a weird thing, where putting one into your army is 
is okay. It has a it has a small amount of impact. They're not great at holding the line. They're better than engineers, but not as good as stains. Um, rune magic is extremely lackluster unless you spam uh, rune smiths. Uh, if you if you put like a full twenty stack of rune smiths and just have like constant rune magic going, that's incredibly powerful. But just having one in your army because the cooldowns are so long, you're just not really making that much use out of it. So if you're a high micro player. Um, the the runesmith doesn't have a lot of value for you, so I'm just going to leave it at B tier. Definitely like a good hero, but just not essential. And then we've got the Thane, which I'll also put at B tier. Doesn't have any particularly special abilities, but this is one tanky motherfucker. So I use these guys here to hold the line. They're the best Dwarfen hero for it. They are really hard for the enemy to kill, especially when you level them up. Really small hero, so it's hard for missile units to hit them, artillery to hit them, monsters to hit them, and they just hold the line really well so that your missile units can do the job. Now, the AI does have a tendency of trying to push through your heroes now and trying to get to your missile line. Uh, so it is important to team these guys up with some melee infantry just behind them, just in case they do decide to go up, but try to spread them as, as thin as possible. So that there is the dwarves. Not too much to say about the dwarves. None of their traits are particularly important, um, nor is their agent actions. This one here damages walls, not overly important. This one here blocks enemy armies um, as dwarves. That is useful, but I would much rather have it attached into the army. I would only block an army if it's really going to get away from me and I don't want it to. Okay, moving on to the green skins. We've got the uh, the Black Orc, uh, Black Orc Big Boss. Now, I believe this guy here is an FLC hero, so you don't need any DLC for this guy, but um, you do have to download the FLC for him. Uh, I'm going to put this guy here at B tier, because this guy doesn't do much for the campaign or battle effects. He doesn't... He, he, can give orc units immune to psychology, which is great and everything. Uh, provide a little bit of casualty replenishment. Uh, but in terms of how much he can boost the army, unless he gets a discipline trait, he's not doing a whole lot. So, it really just comes down to, this guy here is a good fighter. Similar to, like, uh, the Thane, uh, which is I put them on the same tier. Uh, yeah, I, I would, uh, they're just, there's not much to them. They're just a good fighter. They also, I think, increase the public order in a province. So, there's just not that much to go about it. But, very strong fighters. Then we've got the Goblin Big Boss. Now, I'm actually going to put this guy here at A tier because Goblin Big Bosses are really cheap in terms of their upkeep, and they are really good at blocking enemy armies, uh, which is, I think, essential for Greenskins because they have a lot of enemies. And because these guys are so cheap and you can you could definitely get a lot of them. If you're playing as Skarsnik as well, you can reduce the cost um, by 50% of your agent actions and then a bit further in the check tree. So you, blocking enemy armies becomes super, super cheap uh, relatively early on. Blocking enemy armies with Goblin Big Bosses is very viable for Greenskins, which is why I'm putting them up here. I wouldn't put them in my armies. They don't get amazing traits. They can get discipline, but they're horrible fighters, whereas these guys here are... Ex they'll, they'll easily you know, stomp all over them. Even with mounts, these guys here suck. Okay, now we've got um, a, a bit of a weird situation. We've got the Goblin Shaman and the... Um, the Orc Shaman, so Little War and Big War. Now, there's a distinction between these two here. They're, they're different laws of magic, and they take up the same... Uh, unit capacity, but their skill tree is different. These guys here don't have a mount, so the goblin ones, but the, the orc big boss does. Sorry, not big boss, uh, the shaman. Another thing to keep in mind is that there is no orc shaman lord, there's no great orc shaman, apart from uh, Wurzag, where there is a little war uh, great shaman. The Little War Great Shaman has access to Winds of Magic reduction skills when they get the um, at the Arachnorok spider mount, giving them an Arachnorok spider mount as well, making them even stronger. So I say that these guys here just, they're not really needed. The only time I would ever get this guy is to, if he, if he shows up with knowledgeable. So that was the only thing stopping him from getting a D tier. I just, I just don't prioritize getting this one. If I'm going to use that capacity, I always go with the uh, the Orc Shaman because this one here, being a magic battery and also having access to a mount means it's speedy. I can get it out of the way a lot better. And also, of course, they're much better fighters. So this one here, I'd probably put that at A tier because spellcasters are amazing. Then we've got the, uh, the Giant River Troll Hag. Now, very rarely would I ever make a troll high tier but giant river troll hags are sexy as fuck because they are just beautiful what they do is just great they're so multi-purpose they're they're good at 
debuffing enemy units because they stink. Uh, they're decent in melee themselves. They've got a, a good melee line to boost themselves from. They've got access to death magic. They're a winds of magic battery. They've got access to knowledgeable. They've got access to, to discipline. They increase your replenishment rate in your army. Just so versatile. Uh, just a really, really good hero. Covers so much ground relatively fast. It's just such a good unit. Uh, really, really like uh, the Giant River Troll Hag. Uh, the only thing, I suppose, uh, that's really weak against it is that it doesn't get a, a mount, so it's not that fast. And they are kind of a large target, so guns can shoot them up and uh, fairly quickly. But they also have regeneration, so that's that, they're, they're really bloody good, uh, River Troll Hags, so... That's what I'm going to say for them. All right, next up we got the Vampire Counts. Now, the Vampire Counts rely on their heroes perhaps more than any other race with the exception of maybe the High Elves. So most of these heroes are going to be pretty high tier. I'm going to start with the Banshee. Banshees are excellent. I'm going to put this at A tier. It's difficult to get a lot of them quite early on because you have to get to tier 5 to increase capacity. So at tier 4 you can recruit them, but at tier 5... Um, oh, I, sh I should have uh, noted as well, the Giant River Troll Hag as well is a DLC hero. Um, the, uh, the, um, uh, what's it called? The, the Twisted, no, 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 <laughs> which one was it? The Warden and Paunch DLC gives you the, um, the Giant River Troll Hag. Okay, so over here, uh, we've got the, um, the Banshee, which I put at A tier. Uh, really good hero, increases the growth in, in the province that they're in. They're really good at assassinating. Um, they have a trait, Devious, which can allow all heroes in the area to increase success chance, so it's really good for getting Blood Kisses, um, which you can use to unlock your uh, Bloodline Lords, which is really important to do so. Uh, they have the Disciplined trait, so putting them in an army can be useful for boosting your entire army. They're really good fighters because they're ethereal, so they've got loads of physical resistance. You can easily get them at the physical resistance cap, and because they're heroes, you can also give them magic resistance as well, so you can give them loads of magic resistance on top of their physical resistance. Super tanky. Um, then they increase campaign movement range for your armies, which is really good for vampire accounts because they are a very aggressive race. Uh, just a really good hero, but they don't have spell cast, and it's hard to get a lot of them, so I'm just going to put them at A tier. Sh very short of being an S tier one. Then we've got Necromancers. Necromancers are S tier. Necromancers are just great. You can get so many of them, and you can recruit them at super high tier really early on. So Necromancers, um... They boost the income as well, uh, as well, same as the um, the Battle Wizard, in a local area uh, that they're in. They are amazing at boosting skeleton spams. Not only are they a Winds of Magic battery that access to, um, to um, the lore of vampires, they're able to provide a heal buff with Master of the Dead. They're able to go get on an Unholy Lodestone, providing even more uh, regen... In a, local, in a small area, and also provide Vigor Mortis to your units in a local area. I love putting at least one Necromancer in all of my armies. This is an amazing hero. They've just got so much versatility. Uh, so another thing is that they've got access to the knowledgeable trait, so extra winds of magic. They've got access to Law Keeper, um, which gives actually all of the um, the Vampire Count heroes have access to Law Keeper, but this one here increases... Um, the research rate is on top of that, so um, just just a really good hero. Then we've got the White King. Now, I think the White King is perhaps the least useful out of the um, the Vampire Count heroes. I'm just going to put it at B tier, because this is a melee lord, essentially, or melee hero. Um, they don't get knowledgeable. They do get disciplined. They can have Dread Incarnate, which is useful if you want to create a scary stack. And they be can be very good for... Um, uh, assassinating, because they do wound, they don't actually assassinate. Um, so it's good for farming blood kisses, but not killing the hero, so when the hero comes back from being wounded, you can do it again. Uh, but spamming them in an army can be okay, but they don't buff their army um, by very much. You can, but they're, they're good fighters. Similar sort of role to uh, the uh, the Thane and the, um, the Black Orc big boss. Good fighters, put them in B tier, still a good tier. Like, all the tiers are good. We don't have any in the D tier yet, but there will be some that go in there. Uh, but yeah, good hero. Then we've got the Vampire Hero, also S tier. So, Vampires. Uh, spellcasters that get access to Knowledgeable and all the other good traits. Uh, they are really good fighters. They have access to their own regen skill with Immortal Will. Uh, they're good spellcasters with either the Law of Shadows or the Law of Death, uh, which can complement the um, the Law of uh, Vampires, which all of your Lords will have. Uh, they're flying heroes, and they're really hard to kill. So they're really good for harassing the enemy, 
spell casting, uh, winds of magic batteries, extra winds of magic for the entire faction. Just really, really good heroes. Super strong as well. Really, really good. So that's the end of the Vampire Counts there. Now let's move on to the Warriors of Chaos. Now the Warriors of Chaos only have two heroes because they're a shit race, but anyway, whatever. So first thing, we have the Exalted Hero. Exalted Hero would have normally gone under B tier, except for the fact that the Warriors of Chaos are kind of desperate for any kind of help that they can get because they suck so much as a race. So they're actually going to go up to A tier just because their their race needs them a bit more. But in terms of what they do, their capabilities, uh, they would normally be B tier if their race wasn't so shit. Now the reason they're going up to A tier is because, for one thing, these guys here are really good fighters. They can get on a Manticore, but their trait, Infernal Dominance, giving plus 5 melee attack to all units in the army, that's way better than Disciplined. And for the Warriors of Chaos, who need melee attack more than any other stat because you want to kill your enemies quickly... Very, very useful. So putting at least one of them in all of your armies is highly advisable, especially if you go into Shagath spam, because five extra melee attack on all of your Shagaths, very, very good. And, and they're also good for harassing enemy missile units, so good hero. Then we've got the Chaos Sorcerer. Spellcaster going up to S tier. Um, similar um, sort of capabilities as a um, as a Exalted Hero in terms of the trait. They do get the... Um, the Infernal Dominance, they can also get access to the Knowledgeable trait as well. Um, so useful for increasing Winds of Magic fa faction-wide. But of course, as a Spellcaster, you've got access to, to Magic. Now, you can get Spellcaster Lords with the with the, with the the Warriors of Chaos, but still having an, an extra Winds of Magic battery uh, and somebody on a, um, on a Manticore. These guys here are actually pr whoops, uh, pretty good fighters for a Spellcaster, so that's why they're going up into S tier. But in terms of uh, both of their campaign abilities, it's not really that important. But these guys here, because they're the only heroes that the Warriors of Chaos get, and the Warriors of Chaos roster sucks so much, they are very important for the Warriors of Chaos. Okay, next up, the Beastmen. So, we've got the Wargore here. We'll start with this one. Uh, the Wargore is actually, I think it's an FLC unit. I don't I think it's the DLC for, uh, it, have to, correct me if I'm wrong about that, but the latest DLC, the uh, Silence and Fury, that's when they were introduced, but I'm fairly sure that they're actually FLC, but I'm, I'm not 100% on that. Maybe it, maybe these guys here are the DLC and the the, uh, the uh, Bray Shaman Lord is FLC, I can't remember exactly. Uh, yeah, you'll have to correct me. Anyway, the, uh, the War Gore is very good. So I would actually put this one here at A tier because this is really good at boosting melee infantry based armies. They've got a decent mount on either a Tuscal or Razorgore Chariot. They're just really good fighters. Um, in terms of traits that are available to them, they've they've got options. They've got Fear of Nurgle Stink. Uh, you can get Unsated Bloodthirst if you want to um, go with uh, Minotaur Army, although I would usually do that with uh, Gorbals. Um, yeah, just a, just a decent hero. You've also got access to Discipline, I think been a while actually since I played Beastman. But yeah, decent hero. Uh, then we've got the uh, the um, Bray Shaman, just the regular one, not the Lord variant. Uh, putting this one here, Wizard at A tier, because they're really good. These guys here also are reasonably good fighters. Um, there's a lot of items that you can give these guys to boost them a lot. Now they've got their um, special items that you can just buy constantly. Um, you can reduce their winds of magic cost on, on their stuff with uh, tech tree and thanks to Malagor. So they've got very cheap winds of magic cost. And um, just really versatile, especially if you're using the Lore of Wilds. Just, just really good spell cast. I get a lot of kills in with my um, with my Bray Shaman. In terms of their campaign abilities, um, not too much. I usually attach my heroes uh, as the Beastmen in my armies because they've got a lot of potential. And uh, then we've finally got the uh, the Gorbul. Uh, Gorbul is going at A tier as well. I actually think that the Gorbul took a little bit of a nerf in the latest patch because their um, their buffing abilities in a small area they they nerfed it a bit. You can't stack all like three or four uh, different variants at the same time. Uh, and I think they used to be able to boost Gores by a lot, and now they don't. They're still really good fighters. Uh, also really good to have a siege attacker in your army. So. I'm going to put it A tier. It's very easy to get a decent capacity of these heroes, and they don't cost any upkeep, so just high-value heroes here. Um, so, yep, yeah, A tier, uh, sorry, S tier for the wizard, and then A tier for their melee heroes. Okay, now we move on to the wood elves. Starting with the branch wraith. So I'm going to put the branch wraith at... Ooh, I'm going to put it at A tier. 
because I wouldn't say that they're essential, but they are really good. Um, these guys here are a Winds of Magic battery, provided you put them in a um, and put them in the forest. They have okay spell casting, but it's really about the local buffs that they can provide in an area. So they're very heavily dependent on traits. Uh, there's various traits that you can that you can stack in your army. Uh, Murder of Spites. Uh, the one that provides uh, like extra arcane conduit, there's an extra one that um, debuffs the enemy units with their melee attack and weapon strength, and there's one that buffs your units with weapon strength and um, and uh, melee attack. So very useful, but it's uh, it's hard to get like tons of them, and um, yeah, I mean I think A tier is good for them. Uh, I think their biggest weakness is their low mobility, and they're not particularly great fighters, but they're reasonably tanky. So I think A tier is good for them. Next up is the Glade Captain. I'm going to put the Glade Captain at A tier because it is a really good hero. This one here serves the purpose of um, a flying missile unit. So they get them on, on an eagle, and you can shoot. Uh, they've got some pretty good abilities. They've got the Town of Kurnos. They're also able to increase the campaign movement range of your armies by up to like 20, 25%. So really useful for that, because Wood Elves definitely need to be able to move a long distance. They've got to do a lot with the few armies that they've got. So having one Glade Captain in all of your armies, I would say, is pretty much essential. Um, but I don't think they reach the S tier, just because their damage dealing abilities just aren't quite as high as like these guys here. Next up, we've got the Spellsinger. Spellsinger's going into S tier. Really, really good hero. Because um, there are Winds of Magic battery in multiple ways, similar to the uh, the Branch Wraith, in that if you put them in your... Um... Oh, I should probably make the distinction. I think the Glade Captain is... I think it is an FLC hero. I don't think it's a DLC hero. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about that. It came out with the uh, Twisted and Twilight. But I don't think it's actually the DLC here. Anyway, uh, the Spellsinger. The Spellsinger. Um, giving this one uh, the lore of life is usually the way to go. Uh, it gets an eagle, so making them fly around is really useful. Uh, just really good spellcaster. Because one of the things that's uh, really important with the Wood Elves is they have one of the biggest Winds of Magic pools out of any race in the game due to their ability to recruit knowledgeable lords so easily. So magic is really important for the, uh, the Wood Elves. So you can get a lot of use out of the... Uh, out of the spell singers, uh, regardless of which one you go for. So really useful hero there. And then we've got the Waystalker. Now the Waystalker used to be a really good hero, but I actually don't use them that any mu uh, much anymore. I'm actually going to put it down to C tier. They used to be really useful because of their trait. Um, because they used to be able to get um, the uh, Talon of Kurnos. I think it was called. And um, that would provide extra range for all units in your army. But that now only provides range for him. In terms of him buffing units, they have to be close to him. He does have some good use. Um, but a lot of the time I use my Waystalkers as uh, agents on the on the campaign map. Just increasing public order in areas that are, are like in trees that are just struggling with their public order. And that's that's about it. I don't really do do that much with my, with my uh, Waystalkers anymore. I definitely get them. I just don't prioritize them. Another thing to note with the uh, the um, Branch Wraith as well is they also increase growth. But you've got to, you're have got you only going to make use out of that in your actual uh, tree settlement since your outposts don't actually need growth at all. Uh, but overall, I think that the, uh, the Wood Elf heroes are pretty good. But the Waystalker just sort of fell off a little bit. Definitely decent damage dealing. But not as good as they used to be, I think. Anyway, moving on to Bretonia, we have the Paladin. Now, the Paladin is pretty good. Um, I would put it under B tier if the if Bretonia had a bit more options in terms of the heroes. I'm actually going to put it at A tier because uh, these guys here getting their vows sorted make them significantly stronger uh, than like Empire captains or even. Um, uh, but many of these guys here as well, like, uh, like, uh, maybe they're about as strong as an exalted hero. Um, but yeah, in terms of their versatility, they don't actually have that much. You can give them perfect vigor, it's good to attach them with items. They're just, they're good for holding the line, good to have flying units, uh, around them to, for them to fight with. Um, but apart from that, they're really just a melee hero, they don't really buff the army by much at all. So, yeah, uh, good hero, but I'm just going to put it at A. This is not much to say about it. And then we've got uh, the Damsel. Damsel is going into S tier because it's a wizard and Bretonia needs these wizards. Even though you can get Prophetesses, 
Um, I just find that the damsels are also really good because they get access to the knowledgeable trait as well. So really good for boosting all of your wins of magic, whereas your your prophetesses don't. Um, got access to really good laws of magic. You've got access to the law of life and the law of heavens. You've also got beasts, but you know you don't have to get that. Um, and they're they're just really good at their job, I think. So uh, the only problem with them, I think, is that they don't have a flying mount, but. Um, I think that they're a, uh, a good spellcaster. Kind of weird to put them actually next to um, these ones here. So it really comes down to the, what the faction needs rather than competing with... with Like obviously this one here is going to be a better spellcaster than, than the damsel. They you have similar laws of magic. It's just that Bretonia doesn't need to rely on its magic quite as much as the wood elves do. So definitely one... Maybe I should pop it down a tier. Yeah, I think I'm going to pop it down a tier, because yeah, thinking about the damsel compared to these other wizards here, um, like, they're really not good in melee. The spell casting is definitely useful, but not essential for Bretonia. And I'm now that I think about it, I actually don't always put damsels in all of my armies. So yeah, I think I will just drop it down to A tier there, uh, putting them both there. Okay, uh, now we move on to Norska, starting off with the uh, the uh, the Skinwolf Werekin. This is a bit of a strange one, because it's... Very good. They've got access to the Infernal Dominance, so they uh, they do boost the army that they're in. But since I go Mammoth spamming with um, Norska, I usually just prefer more Mammoths because Mammoths have enough melee attack. Uh, so what I do with my Skinwolf Werekins is I get a full stack of Skinwolf Werekins, and they just clean house. They're as good as a Mammoth stack, if not better. So I'm going to put this one here at A tier because it's just a really strong hero. Um, but that's that's all there is to it. Like they they do some boosts in local area, but nothing spectacular. Um, it comes down to just spamming infernal dominance, and these guys here can just really really strong heroes, and they have regen as well, which is uh, particularly good. I think it's uh, pretty interesting to uh, important to note, I suppose. It is technically a DLC um, hero. Same thing with like the warriors of chaos, beastmen, and the Liz uh, and the um, and the wood elf ones, but they're racial uh, DLCs. So yeah, you need the um, uh, what's it called? The Norska DLC for, th for these, obviously. Um, then we've got the uh, Fimir Balefiend. I actually think that these are kind of crap. I'm going to put it at C tier, um, which is weird because it's a spell cast. You might think, but it's a spell cast. Why is it C tier? I hardly ever get these guys. They're like decent in melee, but I hardly ever get them because they're kind of on the expensive side and I don't really put them in my mammoth armies because they are um, they can't keep up with the mammoths. Uh, whereas the the uh, Shaman Sorcerer, they can because of their uh, their mounts are way faster than them. So I usually prefer to put these guys in to my armies instead of the Fimir Bale Fiend. And then I think to myself, do I use these guys on the campaign map? No. And because Norska's budget is so tight, I, I just don't use these heroes at all. So they're just a bit of a weird thing where they have got some cool abilities, but Norska is such a shit faction that I just don't really have any use for them, uh, along with just Fimir in general. So that's why I put it under C tier. Um, probably be a bit contested with some people with that, but yeah, I just don't really, I just don't really use them. I have tried to use them, but I just find the this one here is a lot better. In terms of this one here, I'm also going to put it at A tier. Uh, similar sort of um, combat potential as the uh, the Bretonian wizard. Doesn't have a flying mount. Uh, magic with with uh, Norska is not overly essential, but it's still good. Um, I usually put one of these in my Mammoth armies, uh, but no more than that, because I don't really rely on magic too much uh, with with Norska. It's good, don't get me wrong, it's good to have magic, but I don't rely on it too much. And they don't really have any other major campaign abilities. Uh, I think they these two both have access to Knowledgeable, but yeah, I just, I just don't get these very much, and they're a little bit on the pricey side. So anyway, that's the Warhammer 1 races dealt with, so let's talk about Warhammer 2 races, starting with the High Elves. Alright, so... I think if there was ever a race that had overpowered heroes, it's the High Elves, and it largely comes down to their traits. Starting with the Noble, the Noble is S-tier. Now, this is, this is a bit weird, because all of these other ones here, apart from the Engineer, are basically Wizards. Why is the Noble getting S-tier? The Noble has so much versatility, and it is essential in your campaigns, because if you want access to influence on a, on a regular basis, which you absolutely do, you need nobles. You need nobles to go and secure influence. So you need loads and loads of nobles. Um, then in addition to that, uh, attaching them into my armies after they've already secured like 50 turns worth of, um, of influence, they 
have an eagle mount. They're really good for harassing missile units. So they're decent in melee as well. And then on top of that, you've got traits. These guys have got some of the best traits in the game. You've got frugal, uh, which attached into your army will reduce all, all the upkeep costs in your army by 15%, basically knocking off a supply line. You've got emollient, which will increase your global public order rate and also increase your income from entertainment buildings. You've got conscientious, which will increase lord and noble recruit rank and increase relations with various factions. Um, they've got skills in their skill tree, which uh, gives extra money globally and relations with other factions. These guys here are super versatile and they also increase replenishment in your armies. So they're just, as far as a melee hero goes, nobles are absolutely fantastic. They're not the strongest guys in melee, but because they're so versatile, they, they don't necessarily need to be in order to, to, to compensate for that. Then we've got uh, the wizard over here, the high elf wizard. I'm gonna put it at S tier. Basically, it, for for the this one here, there really needs to be like an SS tier for it, because this is like such an essential hero. Um, their trait: you want to get all of them to be entrepreneurs. The more entrepreneurs you get, it'll compound interest all of your income, and they just send your income into the absolute stratosphere. This is how you make money as the as uh, as uh, the high elves recruit as many entrepreneur heroes as possible. Um, they don't get access to knowledgeable. It's actually the only magic race that doesn't get access to knowledgeable. You do have traits and stuff to do that. Um, they are very good spellcasters. The 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 um, this spellcaster lords are better at spellcasting. But I actually I like to put one of these guys in my armies mostly. It's like, so basically like this: life magic if I'm using like dragons or heroes, uh, light magic if I'm using archers because it's good to use the net of Um Fire magic is good to have dragons if you want to go for that, just for you know, burning shit down. But then I just leave a ton of wizards in either uh, Etain or if I've conquered the Isthmus of Lustria, so Hexavital province, I put them all next. That's, that's the highest base income. That's where they'll make the most money. Uh, and they just make tons of cash. So the entrepreneur trait provides 3% extra tax rate globally and 15% in that particular province. So uh, it's just... When you get one or two of the entrepreneurs, it probably doesn't seem like that much, but when you've got like 15 of them, you'll start seeing them really make a ton of money. So they just they just provide so much value for the army, uh, for the for the faction. Then we've got the Lore Master of Hoeth, another really good hero, but I don't think deserves the S rank. I'm gonna put this one at A rank. Okay. So you've got a good spellcaster that's pretty good in melee. They don't have a mount. Uh, they've got some very good traits. The most notable that I like to get is Fecund, which increases gr growth in the local province by 50 and globally by 5, I think. So getting a lot of those is really useful for getting your growth up really quickly because that's very important with high elves. You want to get to tier 4 and tier 5 as quickly as possible because that's where you increase hero capacities. So very useful if you can get access to that. There's also a lot of other hero traits with them, which I'm not going to go through them all because there's too many. But yeah, you can make some pretty damn good doom stacks with uh, Lore Masters of Hoeth. But I think that they're less essential and way more late game than than these two here. Then we've got the Handmaiden. S tier. Okay, Handmaiden, similar sort of versatility as the Noble. It's just an all-round good hero. So they increase growth in local province uh, through their skill tree. They're able to through uh, various mutually exclusive lines in their skill tree, they can either increase your uh, rate of influence, they can improve uh, relations with all factions, they can have like a net of Amentok, uh, and they could, or they could um, do hawkish precision for all of your archers. Uh, they provide replenishment in your army, uh, they are re reasonably good horse archers, they're reasonably decent melee units that can hold the line reasonably well. They've got access to a bunch of different traits, so they've got access to the fecund trait, uh, so those ones there will increase growth in, in the uh, for your faction. You've got the entrepreneur trait, uh, but it's pretty rare for that one to show up, whereas the wizard's ones it shows up all the time because they've got so many laws of magic. Uh, sometimes with this one you'll even have two in a single turn. Uh, and they've got the resistant trait. Now the resistant trait is the one that I really like pulling into my armies because it provides magic resistance, 5% uh, magic resistance, 5% missile resistance, and 5 extra melee defense uh, for all infantry in your armies. But some of those, some of, I think the resistance is provided all units, but the Ek 5 melee defense is for all for all uh, infantry and units in your army. So if you're running with a Sisters of Avalon uh, army, or even just a basic archer army, having 
five or ten, if you get two of them, extra melee defense means that you don't need spearmen or anything to hold the line. This one here turns all of your archers into spearmen, into essentially melee infantry because they hold the line so much better. Such a good hero. Also a thing to note, you need the queen and the crone to get this DLC. So, uh, to get this particular hero. So this, this one here is a, uh, a DLC hero. Okay, now we move on to Dark Elves. Alright, first up we have got the K Knight Assassin. This one here I'm going to put at... I'm going to put it at S tier. Yeah, I'm going to put it at S tier. But for a, for a bit of a weird reason. Okay, so I think that K Knight Assassins in my armies are basically useless. Uh, I just don't find they do much damage. They don't boost the army at all. Uh, I just don't find them very useful at all. But in the late campaign, the main thing that you want a K Knight Assassin for is to put them in your richest slave province because they boost the income that you get from slaves. These guys here are essentially your entrepreneurs as the Dark Elves. You're already making tons of money from slaves, right? In, in particular provinces. You put a bunch of these guys in that, all, like all of your Canine Assassins in your richest province, whether that be Nagarond, Yvres, wherever, and these guys here will make you so much money. So these ones here are basically your entrepreneurs. And that is the only reason I put them in S tier. Because of just how much, like the sheer amount of money that these guys can make for you is absurd. But that really comes into late campaign. And once you've got, you know, a lot of slave, um, slave buildings, really, really important to have that. Uh, then we've got the Death Hag. Now, I used to really like the Death Hags, but I like them a lot less than I used to. I'm going to put them at B tier. I find they're actually not very good fighters. Uh, as, as if they're on foot, they're a little bit squishy, and if they're on the uh, the uh, the blood cauldron, they're too big. They get hit too easily, and they're susceptible to friendly fire. Uh, they do increase the replenishment rate, but dark elves don't have that much of a repl replenishment problem, I think. Plus, because they take on so many captives, um, they can replenish just by winning battles well. So, not really a huge issue for the dark elves. Um, but yeah, their actual battle prowess is not particularly useful, and they the only really good trait that they have is disciplined. So, I tend not to prioritize them that much anymore, but putting one of them in the army is not too bad. Then we've got the sorceress over here, the, uh, the hero in the dark elves that can get knowledgeable so i'm going to put that one also at s tier because really good hero you can get them uh fairly cheap especially if you're playing as marathi uh they've got access to knowledgeable you've got access to some really good laws of magic they've got um a flying uh dark pegasus so really good spellcaster you've got a lot of access to winds of magic as the dark elves because they've actually got access to, to knowledgeable so they're comparable in terms of damage dealing uh with um other flying uh spellcasters and uh, they're just uh, just really good at what they do. Okay, next up we've got the Master. Okay, so Masters, I'm also going to put at S tier. And this one here does require a DLC. You need the um, the uh, Shadow and Blade DLC. So the Snitch and um, Malice Dark Blade DLC. Uh, if you want to get this one. Uh, the reason that this one here is an S tier, I don't put these guys in armies, but if you want to do that, you can. They do make good armies. They've got access to the Spiteful trait, which is very useful, plus three melee attack for the entire army. A Doomstack of these guys can be very powerful, but the reason that I'm putting these guys in S tier is for one reason only. These guys reduce the slave decline rate in the local province. So this unit, if you... Well, this hero, if you put two of them, a minimum of two of them in a province and then stack the other things that you can do to reduce um, slave decline rate, it's possible to get slave decline rate to 0%. Prior to this hero being introduced, it was virtually impossible to do that. But these guys here, coupled with these, like, you could just have such a ridiculous amount of slave income that doesn't deteriorate really quickly. So these guys here, like, these guys here make you the money, and these guys here make sure that if you're not fighting to enough battles, that, that it's actually sustainable. So they, they really help a lot, because slave decline rate at 20%, you can lose a lot of slaves every turn by that, especially if you've got loads of them. So really, really useful hero just on that regard. And they also increase public order in the local area, which is useful because slaves cause public order problems, and Dark Elves don't exactly have the best public order uh, issues. Um, so very good hero, that's why I'm putting it at S tier there. Uh, fun funny enough, with the uh, the Dark Elves, their, um, their heroes were almost at the same sort of rank as the High Elves, just apart from the uh, the Death Hag there. Alright, now we move on to the Lizard Men. Oh, you know what? One thing I forgot to mention about the uh, um, 
handmaidens is that when they get to rank 16, they increase global uh, public order by plus one. Probably should have mentioned that, but I just forgot until now. Just another reason why they're at S tier. I just remembered that then. Okay. That's probably because I was looking at this guy here who has a, uh, a similar thing. All right. So let's move on to the Sora Scar veterans. All right. These ones here are going to S tier because these are possibly the best melee hero in the game. Um, at low ranks, they're not particularly good, but once you get them on a Carnosaur, holy crap, that's one of the best mounts in the game. It's fast, it's a killing machine, just really, really good, right? So, yeah, you've got an absolute killing machine here that um, they can get the Discipline trait or the Pompous trait, which is really good. Getting a full stack of these guys, super dangerous. Um, on a Carnosaur, they don't have the Rampage. Like, Carnosaurs are really good, like Feral Carnosaurs would be if they just didn't Rampage, but these guys here don't Rampage, so really, really useful. But also, I think at rank 20? Yeah, at rank 20, they get um, Honorable Elder, I think it's called. And um, that provides plus one extra public order faction wide, which is, which is really useful. Now the the Saurus, uh, old bloods can get that as well, but I don't prioritize them as a lord, so I tend not to do that very much uh, with them. But I do prioritize the Saurus Scar veteran, really good hero, a lot of potential with that. Uh, next up, we have the Skink Priest. I'm going to put this one here at A tier, really good but not essential. Uh, provides uh, casualty replenishment, um, just just. Basically, I put them on a Stegodon. Uh, basically, it's just an extra Stegodon in my army. Uh, but that, it comes with some traits and equipment. But yeah, I mean, anybody on a Stegodon is going to be really strong. Uh, these guys here, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's basically just a Stegodon that provides casualty replenishment for all my army. So I usually put uh, one of them on my armies just to do that because um, they're just good. Um, then we've got the Skink Priest. Uh, these guys here, really, really good. I'm going to put it as S tier uh, because they get Stegodons. They get Ancient Stegodons with the uh, Engine of the Gods, so the Solar Beam Cannons, which is really bloody powerful. They get access to Knowledgeable, uh, which is insanely good. And, uh, you know, you've, you've also got a really good melee mount. This is possibly the strongest wizard in the game once they're on those mounts. Uh, really, really strong. So that's why it's going up to S tier there. And of course, knowledgeable is uh, very good for the high, uh, for for this, well, really for every race because you want as much winds of magic as possible. And then we've got the Skink Oracle, which again is going up to S tier. Really good hero. Um, this one here is a DLC with the uh, with the um, what's it called? The Silence and the Fury. It came out fairly recently. So these guys here start off at rank one on a Troglodon. They've got a fairly versatile uh, set of. Uh, of um, spells so they've got the law of life or well, they've got earth blood um, whereas skink priests don't so if you're if you get sick of getting life slands these guys here can be an appropriate um, substitute although slands are still better uh, these guys here are good in melee they I think they increase your campaign movement range I think they also increase growth in the local province so really useful but the only problem with them it's hard to get lots of them because they they um, are increased in capacity at tier 5 and by that point a lot of the time the campaign's already over so really good hero but you're probably not going to see that many of them but yeah really good all right now we move on to skaven so now skaven have a bunch of dlc heroes which we'll go into that in a bit all right the assassin uh, assassins are okay i don't put them in my army i'm going to put it at b tier what i do with my assassins is that i look for the cunning trait and i usually try to have one cunning assassin orbiting every one of my army so what they do is they scout ahead and increase the chance of ambushing in the local area and uh, do any assassinations that I might need to do. And if my army is particularly badly damaged and has a free slot, you can attach it into your army for extra casualty replenishment. But in terms of their combat prowess, they're not very good. I did try to do a, um, a spam of them with Snitch because he's able to boost the stats of heroes, but it wasn't very good. So I use these guys as mainly just extra ambush success chances and scouting. Um, they're relatively cheap, not too difficult to get. Uh, I definitely build those buildings because of other effects. So, yep, um, good hero, uh, but B tier for it. Next up, we've got the Chieftain. Chieftain's a very good hero. I'm going to put this one at A tier. It's got some really good... Um, it's got some really good... Uh, what's it called? Um, like, agent action. It's got access to block. Um, attaching them into your army uh, can give your lord extra 5% ward save, which is good because it stacks. So if you get 
19 of them, or 20 of them, you've got, well, you can't get 20, but you can, you can essentially get 100% ward save. So you actually only want 18 because you can't actually get 100%, 90% is the most you can get. So I actually find if you want to do Snitch with a hero doom stack, these uh, chieftains are the best way to go because you can get Snitch to 90% ward save. And these guys here will be boosted by Snitch. Um, just providing heaps of benefits. So they're really good fighters when they get onto a um, a bone breaker. Just just a really good hero, but not deserving of the S tier. I'm gonna put them at, at A tier. <laughs> There's no D tier heroes yet. But guess what? It's coming. Alright. Coming right now actually. Next up we have the Eshin Sorcerer. Now we need to make a distinction here between the Eshin Sorcerer and Plague Priest. Plague they because they use up the same amount of capacity, but they are vastly different in how they perform, even though it's like different laws of magic, right? It all comes down to their skill sets. All right, so the Eshin Sorcerer is a D tier hero. I never get Eshin Sorcerers. They suck. They really suck. They're like mediocre in melee. Their lore of magic is vastly inferior to plague magic. Um, they don't get a mount. They're just, they just don't have very good stuff. So this one here is actually a DLC hero. So you need the, um, the, uh, the Shadow and Blade DLC to get this. I, I believe the, the Chieftain is actually an FLC. But we should have mentioned that. Um, but yeah, it's a it's just a really shit hero in my opinion. Uh, you can, I mean, you can get some damage out of it with with, <laughs> with the Lore of Shadows. It's just that, uh, sorry, Lore of Eshin Stealth Magic. It's just that I would vastly prefer the Plague Priest. And since, since they use up the same capacity, um, that's the primary reason why I don't get them. If they weren't, Using up the same capacity, I'd probably get more of them. The only time I would ever get them, really, is if Knowledgeable shows up. That's about it. Um, then we've got the um, the Plague Priest. S tier. I love Plague Priest. In fact, I love them so much, I try to put four of them in all of my Weapon Team's army. Because these units here are my front line. Uh, not only are they have an amazing amount of uh, potential uh, similar to actually to the river troll hag because not only do they have a spell line but they've also got a melee line as well so they're decent in melee and they've got a, a good mount so the plague furnace is a lot of people don't know this actually it's actually a mortis engine so it goes into melee and causes damage to everyone around it but anyway usually i put these guys on foot um, if it's a field battle, but uh, if it's a siege battle, I'll put them on the uh, Plague Furnace. Because if they're on foot, the rattling guns tend to shoot them because it's just a big unit. But anyway, primary use of these guys is just to cast um, Vermintides, summon the clan rats essentially, to hold the enemy back. These guys are worth infinite number of Storm Vermin. These are my frontline units. They've got their Winds of Magic battery. If you've got four of them, you'll have plenty of Winds of Magic and hold back full stacks quite easily. Really good in choke point situations. And in Sieges, Plague Magic dishes out like 80 to 90% of the damage I need to actually win the battle. Just an absolutely essential hero. So I really like them. And another thing with them is due to the... Um, the, uh, the Bell Polisher follower, which you'll end up getting loads of uh, throughout the campaign, you'll have no problem recruiting tons of these heroes. Also, they get access to the Cunning Train. All of the Skaven heroes get access to Cunning, uh, and they get access to Knowledgeable as well. Truly a fantastic bloody hero. Disgusting, but, but fantastic. All right, then we've got the, um, the uh, Packmaster. Packmaster is also an S tier hero. Now this one is a DLC hero that comes with the Twisted and Twilight with the Throt DLC. Uh, I believe it came at the same time as this one, but this one here is uh, FLC. So the uh, the Packmaster, um, it is it's a bit of a weird situation. I don't usually put them in my weapons team army. I put them either in a full stack of Packmasters because they get the Brood Horror mount, which is one of the best mounts in the game. But then they've got the uh, the no cost Winds of Magic summon spell of Wolf Rats, and they can get up to four of excuse me four of them. Really bloody useful. And uh, they're able to reduce the upkeep cost uh, and increase the replenishment rate of various monsters for um, for the Skaven. So what this guy here does is it makes monster armies way more viable. So previously, before the Twisted and Twilight, it was basically the only true doomstack for the Skaven was the weapon team army. But once Clan Mulder came along, monsters became way more viable thanks to this one here. So I actually tend now in my late game sc uh, Skaven armies to have different types of armies thanks to this hero. So a very good hero there. And they also increase the growth in a province, which is totally useless for Skaven because they get tier 5 settlements all the time. Because if you're using food properly, which you should be, um, you don't bother using growth. You just push a settlement straight up to its max tier. But if you 
if you're not very good and you're you're capturing settlements at tier one uh, having a few of these guys here uh, in your provinces can really help and then we've got the warlock engineer s tier fan fucking tastic uh honestly kind of puts the dwarf engineer to shame a little bit because um everything the dwarf engineer can do this guy here kind of does better um increases campaign movement range increase ammunition increase weapon damage increased um increase uh, firing rate um also increases range which this guy here no longer does uh, also has access to a Doom Rocket, has access to the Law of Ruin. So particularly useful with Engineers is that you use them for Howling Warp Gale if the enemy bring Flyers. So really, really useful. Uh, and they've got some decent melee skills as well. They don't have a Missile line, but I usually... Uh, missile attack, but I usually keep them around my Missile units, around my Weapons teams, to uh, boost them and also if there's any... Uh, anyone nearby to hurt them, get the, any flyers that is, pop down the Howling Whoop Gale. So truly a, an amazing hero in that one. Difficult to increase the capacity of since it, you can do so at tier 5, but really, really good hero. And that there concludes the Skaven. Now we move on to Tomb Kings. Now funny thing with Tomb Kings is that their heroes are pretty much essential, but they're also kind of shit. Um, I don't think any of these are going to actually get S tier, uh, because uh, you get a limited number of them and they're... Um, actually, maybe the Necrotech. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that. But yeah, um, but because of the limitations of the Tomb Kings, you absolutely do need them, even though they're far from the best heroes in the game. Let's move on to uh, the Tomb Prince first. The Tomb Prince is okay. Good fighter. Doesn't really provide any benefits to the army at all. Um, yeah, just a really good chariot fighter. I tend to put all of my Tomb Princes into one army and just make a Tomb Prince army. Um... They can also be fairly useful for attaching various uh, followers like the Channel Valley Necrotech to do the economy cheese for the uh, the Tomb Kings. But this is hardly an essential hero, so I'm actually going to put it at B tier. Um, they're just good fighters, so they're going with the other things that are kind of only one-dimensional. It's kind of the one-dimensional thing uh, line there. Then we've got the Lich Priest. Now, Lich Priests are wizards, so they're needed in your armies, but you're limited in number of them you can't under any circumstance put one in every single one of your armies um if they if they were a bit more versatile i'd probably put them up to s tier but i'm going to put it at a tier because yeah they've kind of got lousy laws of magic uh light is okay that's probably the best one that i use shadow is okay i don't really like nehekara i used to but no i don't really like it and i don't really like death that much um they do get access to knowledgeable i guess it's also important to note this is a, a dlc unit because this is a dlc race um but yeah, just the good spellcasters, but not anywhere near as good as the S tier spellcasters. They don't have an amazing mount. All they get is a as a steed, um, which is make, it's very vulnerable. And it's not particularly fast, um, but that's the best they've got. But I think A tier is okay for them. And then we've got Necrotect. I think I will put Necrotect at S tier because of what it can do. Um, so this guy here increases your campaign movement range, which is really important. Um, and increases your capacities for certain heroes, uh, sorry, certain units. So you really want to get, in my opinion, either the Scorpion Carver or the Sphinx Carver. So Scorpion Carver will give you two extra Tomb Scorpions, Sphinx Carver will give you one extra Chemian War Sphinx, and then through their line, you can increase them further. And then they're okay units on chariots, uh, but I definitely want to spread them out across my armies and have sort of one in each, although you can't get enough of them to put one in each. Um... But yeah, I, I have a tendency of getting my Necrotex killed though, <laughs> because they are a bit squishy. Um, but they do provide a lot of benefits for Constructs, and Constructs are definitely your best units. So that's why I'm going to put it up to S tier. Next up, Vampire Coast. Okay, all three of these actually get access to Knowledgeable, which is weird because this is the only non-spellcaster in the game, uh, same thing with the Gunnery White, uh, that uh, actually has access to Knowledgeable. The only problem with the these heroes is that increasing their capacities is a pain in the ass. To increase capacity for the um, for the Gunnery White and Mongol Haunter, you need to create a uh, pirate cove. Pirate coves are either really expensive to make, or you need to get an army to go into it. I don't like pirate coves uh, how they're currently formed. They're like shitter versions of the uh, the um, under cities. Um, so I don't prioritize it that much. I just don't think it's optimal. Um, but apart from that, I think they are good heroes. At least these ones here, the the captains, they can increase their capacity at tier 5 and through um, 
uh, tier five major port settlements that is uh, through the port and uh, through the shipbuilders. So let's start with the gunnery white. I'm gonna put this one here at A tier because it is good to have somebody to replenish ammunition in an army. They do get access to a knowledgeable trait and having extra wins of magic is good. They can do a ton of damage uh, with their guns, but they are extremely squishy. This is one of the few units that I would actually give the mount the Rotting Prometheon because you don't necessarily want this guy into melee. It's just that raising this guy up allows him to shoot down at an angle and kind of makes him more accurate. So. Yeah, I think that's an A tier unit. Same thing with the Mongol Haunter. I put it at A tier. You can make a good Doom Stack with it, but it's so difficult to get a lot of capacity with them. That's why I'm just going to put it down to A tier there. It's just kind of a really inconvenient unit to prioritize. And then we've got the uh, Pirate Fleet Captain, which I'm going to put at. I'm not going to put it at S tier because they don't have good mounts and they're not really the best spellcasters and they're honestly quite squishy. Um. I think in terms of their spellcasting abilities, they're kind of on par with the other spellcasters that are here, and it's difficult to get a lot of them, and, um, you know, they've got access to Lore of Deeps and the Lore of Vampires, which is good, and the Death, but we'll forget about that one, um, but yeah, they're just not the greatest heroes, and uh, there we have the, <laughs> the tier list, where we have more S tier heroes than anything else, then A tier is the next most, then B tier, only a handful of C tier, and only one D tier. So the worst hero in the game, in my opinion, is the Shadow Sorcerer here, the uh, Eshin one. But don't forget what like I said at the beginning, is that all of these heroes here are good in their own way. None of them are like trash, except for this one, right? Um, it's just a matter of how much potential they actually have for all of their factions across all the various things that they can do. These ones here having the most potential to do the most amount of good for their factions, and these ones here being the least effective, being the you know the ones that provide the least amount of value. That's all it really comes down to. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the hero tier list. This one here took quite a lot of research and figuring this one out and how we're going to do this. Uh, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check out Instant Gaming, link in the, in the description if you haven't got all the DLC. Any DLC that you purchase for Warhammer 1 and 2 will be translated over to Warhammer 3, as long as you own Warhammer 1 and 2. So you'll be able to play all that stuff in Mortal Empires when, whenever that comes for Warhammer 3. So don't be uh, don't be afraid of purchasing DLC, even though Warhammer 2 is on the, the end of its life cycle. Um, Warhammer in total, Total War Warhammer is really only halfway through its life cycle so you'll still be able to make sure uh, make use of all the dlc and like i said instant gaming just got good prices anyway that's the end of this one here appreciate you guys and i'll see you next time fuckers bye